Major funding for this program has been provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding has been provided by the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities, David Bruce Smith, and the Mid-Atlantic Regional Arts Fellowship. In my toes, the doctor said they're going to take it off because I sit on ice. I froze last winter. That's why I came here to see Mr. Ronald Reagan. I want to know why I'm out there homeless. America's major cities today, you come across the homeless living on the streets. Most of us choose to ignore their plight. But in the winter of 1984, one community group in the nation's capital asked the federal government to let it use an abandoned building to shelter the homeless. The response was immediate. Between 600 to 1,000 men and women showed up every night for a meal and a bed. These services were provided by the volunteer staff of the Community for Creative Nonviolence. They also solicited food and money to run the program. But the crumbling building they occupied, still owned by the federal government, was in dire need of repair. This is the story of their four-year struggle to create a model shelter. And what are you trying to accomplish in this past? For a number of months, we have been negotiating with the administration to, number one, get them to repair the Federal City College and bring it up to code and some kind of human standards. For really months and months, they have said no. across the street that we need a decent place to live. We don't have to remind you of the shower facilities or the bathrooms or the fact that the plumbing doesn't work. In fact, the place is a sweat box. A controversy grew over the repair of the shelter. CCNB members felt it was the government's responsibility. The government said no. Finally, in a desperate attempt to force the government to improve conditions, 11 members went on a fast and drank only juice. Snyder drank only water. Do you think 11 people fasting is going to change an entire administration policy? Oh, I think one decent person with enough commitment and, and enough integrity and enough concern for their neighbors could turn the world upside down. Unfortunately, we don't have folks like that running around our nation or our world in great numbers right now. The CCNV, or Community for Creative Nonviolence, grew out of the anti-war movement of the 1960s and is now dedicated to serving the poor. Members come from different backgrounds and religions, and some of them have been homeless themselves. I've been homeless for the last, since 1969, off and on, but I'm not in the, in the penal institutions. So since I've been out, I haven't been locked up or anything concerning that, and I've been with the community in the house ever since. And I've been doing superb, serving the community. Everyone who's on the streets is on the streets because there is no one who can provide them what they need to get the hell off. Anyone who thinks anyone is on the streets by choice is saying that out of a bed, out of a warm, comfortable home with a roof over their heads and money in their pocket and food in their stomach, because no one, no one has a, an inborn predilection for freezing to death or sleeping in the rain or being mugged or beaten or brutalized. So how long this fast lasts is going to be answered by someone who lives across the street. It's a shallow presentation of the whole problem. We're talking about 600,000 beds in the United States for mental uh, patients that have been cut down to 125,000. We're talking about gentrification of cities in which cities have been ripping down buildings where people used to live at $100 a month and could maybe afford that. And uh, we've, we've lost one million units of single residency occupancy where people can live. They don't have to tell me what to be down the street is the one. I know. This isn't the first time I've been like this. I've been on hobos, on the train riding tracks and everything since I've been out of the service. 
I fought for this country to get it better than what it is now, but it looked like to me it's getting worse. And I hate it. I got kicked out in the streets, and then I was staying with, I was staying with neighbors, then I stayed in a vacant house once, and then they kept, they kept on telling me to go to a shelter house, but I couldn't imagine shelter house. I never went to a shelter, I never heard of them. There really are basically three different levels of homeless people that, that need help. You have the, the family, maybe the displaced family, who needs a place. Um, maybe just a temporary place where they can live while they're looking for another job or finding another place to stay. And then you have another stage of people who um, maybe have been on the streets a while and don't have much training for jobs, the people that would need job training and that would need special help in getting mainstreamed back again. And then there's another level made for the mentally ill, maybe those who are never going to be capable of holding a job, but certainly need to be treated with dignity and respect. This is the only federal building in the United States currently being used to house the homeless. And it seems to us that the government has a responsibility to put it in at least minimally humanly habitable shape, and they haven't. And that's one of the reasons why we're fasting. There's about uh, six, seven, eight hundred people a night that stay here. Many of them are women and children. Um, the conditions are such because the government won't fix up the building. This room is occupied by people who are, uh, most of them are insane. Many of them have lice. And so other people in the shelter don't want to stay in the same room with them. And we believe that as crazy as they may be, or as lice infected as they may be, and refusing any kind of treatment or showers or anything, that they still have a right to be inside. So that's, that's what this room is set aside for, and that's the way it looks. That's why it looks the way it does. These two showers serve between 150 and 200 people, and there's two other showers in the building that serve the other four or 500 folks each night. right out. The same thing happened on the other side. You know, all the way across this whole wall. It's a roof over your head. That's the main thing. And this is what we're striving for, for the people, you know, also myself as well as the people, you know, that comes in every night. You know, they have all kind of problems. <laughs> Mitch Schneider came from a lower middle-class Jewish family in Brooklyn, New York. A high school dropout, he went from job to job, married young and had two sons. But he left his family in the early 70s and got into trouble with the law and did a stint in prison. While there, he met the activist Berrigan brothers and was deeply influenced by their ideas of social justice. We want that building fixed up because we cannot live with it. The administration saying in everybody's name, including ours, that it has no responsibility to people who are the poorest of the poor. How are you feeling yourself? Excuse me? How are you feeling yourself? Well, not real great. It's the 40th day of a fast. Uh -huh. I lost 50 pounds as of today, and I'm dehydrating very rapidly. So I don't, I don't feel good. Thank you. Thank you. Snyder has been too weak to leave his bed since his arrest a week ago at the White House when, his staff says, police left him in rain-soaked clothing for 13 hours on the floor of a jail cell and in a police van. He was then in his 40th day of fasting. 
The CBS program 60 Minutes plans a report on Snyder and CCNV this Sunday evening. More than 50 million people will see that report. Snyder hopes Ronald Reagan is one of them. He also hopes he lives to see it himself. These are the remains of six homeless people who died of exposure on the streets of Washington. People here at the CCNV say if the Reagan administration doesn't act, more people will die this winter. What's like being homeless is hell. Eating out of a dumpster. Going around with no shoes on the feet, with freezing toes, with no pants on, no jacket, no coat, no socks on, bad breath, smelling like shit, looking like shit. It's hard out here, man. If the president got sense enough to come see what's happening, instead of going around the world flashing his face, he should see what's wrong with us. Right here this is home. home. We don't care nothing about us, but we're going to make them listen, though, because I refuse to go down. Because I believe in fighting for my right. Lead us not into no temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, ever. Amen. Have mercy, Lord. <laughs> We have people that are going to be dying on the streets when this cold weather hits. And we have a president that says if any American is homeless, it's because he wants to be homeless. Now, since when have we reached that point in our country where we remain indifferent? We have a real crisis in America. Mitch knows it, he feels it, and uh, he's willing to die. When Mitch Snyder and 11 volunteers began their fast here at the White House 46 days ago, only they knew how far they were willing to go with it. And no one was able to say how long the administration would be able to ignore it. But now, a month and a half later, someone has to blink. Mitch Snyder's doctors say it's unlikely he'll survive the week. Mitch is very, very ill. He's in a lot of pain, and he's just not sleeping at all at night. He's absolutely exhausted. He's, uh, he's thermostat, his body thermostat is all screwed up and so he's either very hot or very cold. Today he's very hot, which is why he's not wearing a lot of clothing. He says he'll answer two questions totally. Uh, so you all decide who's going to ask the questions. I'm not going to deal with that. any food, liquid or solid in this place? Absolutely nothing but water. Mitch, why do you feel that fasting to death, if that's necessary, will do more for the homeless than staying alive, fighting for them as you have been. We have no choice. We have to risk ourselves to try and save them. The next time you see someone out on the street, don't pass them by. Say hello, ask how they're doing, get them something hot to drink, get them something to eat. Just tell them that you care. Tell them that they're human beings. I think that's what I would ask of anyone. Mitch Snyder, the leader of the Community for Creative Nonviolence, is in Howard University Hospital tonight after ending his 51-day fast. When Mitch Snyder was wheeled from the ambulance into Howard University Hospital at 3 this afternoon, he was near death, too weak to open his eyes or to talk. All night long, he and Carol Fennelly, a spokeswoman for the Community for Creative Nonviolence, had negotiated over the telephone with Health and Human Services Secretary Margaret Heckler and Harvey Veith, the coordinator of President Reagan's task force on the homeless. The final go came from President Reagan himself this afternoon aboard Air Force One. Under the agreement, the federal government will renovate the Federal City College building that was turned over to CCNV by the federal government last winter. They will build a kitchen area so that meals can be prepared there, and they will add lockers, a laundry room, a first aid station, and repair the sprinkler system to make the building fire safe. It's wonderful. It's so wonderful. I'm so rejoiced. I don't know what to do. It's unbelievable. <laughs> 
The announcement of an agreement between Snyder and the Reagan administration is being called an election eve coup, scoring points for President Reagan, whom Snyder had originally accused of being callous to the needs of the poor and the homeless. We don't care whose hands it plays into if what we're doing results in something good and allows the people involved to do something good. The President of the United States, being that he is a, a decent human being, he didn't want somebody to die for something. Um, but I think Mitch Schneider took it to the point where, you know, it never should have gotten to. And I do believe that in some ways it was a case of emotional blackmail. Snyder says he timed as fast to coincide with the weather getting colder and with the election to apply the maximum pressure. They have a lot of expertise at the media, uh, with the media. And as far as 60 minutes, it was the night before the election. And uh, I have to admit that, that that had some play. There's no doubt about it. But it wasn't the total play. It wasn't that 60 minutes was on the air, therefore do something, because we were doing something. I would have had something on Monday that may, may have been acceptable. I don't know, but Mitch was standing awfully firm. Months went by, and despite the president's promise, no improvements were made on the shelter. Yes, okay, you can come in. And how was your day? Okay, all right. Good. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hi. You getting all ready to go to school? So around 11, 12, 11, 11.30 at night, we lock this door, and the men come in, the women come in the center entrance, which works out very nicely. Everything's nice and peaceful at night. Okay, this is our little room. In fact, the architects took uh, photographs of it because it has become the model for our new model shelter for the individual cubicles or little tiny rooms for the women. And the space efficiency is just enough for a private room, and yet not to have too much space that uh, would... Um, she did have it in beautiful reds and greens, and you can see she is changing it into the lovely pink and green instead. A lot of the things here are made out of cardboard and boxes that, that have been tossed away, and she gathered and constructed a little room for herself. And there's a little mirror on the wall she found in the garbage. And she fixed it up so it looks kind of like a stained glass window. And this is Phyllis, who has worked so hard to make this as a lovely room. And as I said, it was green and red. And now she's turning it into a pink and spring green room. And it's very pretty, and a lot of people love it. OK, go brighten you. I'll let you see my room, OK? <laughs> she said. You got a room up there, but I like the lounge because I come in contact with people, and it gives a joy to me. See, I'm a stranger here in D.C., and I love to meet the people. Nobody's coming up to your private room because I got so much junk in there. She's going to throw me out on my street, on my head, if I don't put them in boxes. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Hello, everybody. How are you? I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Well, I have to get my chair to stand up in. I know this looks like a pile of junk to you. But I do have valuable things. See, what would this look like? It's a beautiful color, isn't it? It's crepe. You see how it's made? The lace at the top. I guess this is the front. Understand? And that panel is in the back. If you take that and you work sequins and crystal beads, spangles all over it, and in the back you would put a design here, couldn't a model walk out on the stand and look beautiful in this rag? Sir? Right. If I can take junk out of the garbage and make it attractive, I enjoy it. No repairs were made for eight months after Mitch ended his fast. 
Negotiations with the federal government had reached an impasse. There were basic philosophical differences. Working with the CCNV, we created a uh, quite extensive comprehensive shelter, unlike anything that's ever been done in the uh, country, um, very heavily involved in support activities, social service area, medical facilities, central laundry facilities, main central kitchen facilities, and in conjunction, it was very, very important to be able to break down this large population into five sub-shelters, each housing approximately 200 residents. So you never have a sense that you're there as an individual with a thousand other people. What the federal government had proposed was the notion of an instant um, response to the problem, uh, envisioning the creation of barracks uh, very quickly, very simply, just uh, large amounts of open area and bunk beds and, and so forth. Good for you being here. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you very much. It's good to be here. It's just like last summer over there, huh? Oh, not quite. There. I thought it was all over, didn't you? I thought, well, I think, you know, it's a matter of government regulation over government hospitality. <laughs> Tell him we're here. Okay. There's three of us that want to meet with the president, so we brought some chairs, and we're just going to get out of the way and not block traffic, but just wait for the president to meet with us. Okay, okay sir. Someone Thank you, sir. Notified that you are. Have a lovely day. Okay. Under ancient Irish law, it's called Brehan law, it says that if you've been wronged by someone of superior rank, after you've asked them repeatedly and politely yeah. for redress of grievance, if they continue to refuse, you go sit outside their door, and you wait for them to do justice. And you wait for as long as you have to wait. So, so since the that? president's uh, an old Irishman and it's an old Irish tradition, we figured he might understand and he might respond. And that's what we're doing. We're asking the president to do justice because he publicly promised 700, 800 homeless people in that building and a couple of million across the country that he was going to make a model shelter for them that was going to take us out of the dark days of people eating out of garbage bales and bring us into a little bit better future. They know damn well that the moment we open up that shelter in model condition with lots of doctors and nurses and psychiatrists and teachers and students running in to provide services, they're going to have to duplicate that model in city after city across this country. And that's okay. Oh my goodness. You're committing a violation of structures. These chairs on the um, White House side. I pray you arrest us. I pray right now that you arrest us. Go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. I hate to be too hot for television, but in 1905, peasants walked up to the Tsar and said, Little Father, we're hurting. Help us. And Little Father shot the peasants. Today, the homeless came to the White House and said, Mr. President, your word has been violated by bureaucratic, mean-spirited people who work for you. And now you want to arrest us for sitting in three chairs outside your shelter. Outside your shelter. I say behind the lamppost, I mean behind the lamppost. Please, everybody. Watch out. I want you back behind the lamppost. Move it along. The Statue of Liberty is to everyone a symbol of freedom that people that the people in America care whether people are poor or not. That, uh, you know, give us, you're tired, you're hungry, you're poor. You're downtrodden, the ones that are not free to come to Ameri the American shore. And everyone loves it so much that I'm including it. Doing research on every single one of these. I had all the librarians over the Martin Luther King Library helping me look. Let me just fix your pearl right there a minute. That's Jackie Kennedy. The women here like her very much because of her interest in the arts. And then we have Lena Horn, and her favorite theme song that everybody loves is Stormy Weather, going like this. Don't know why there's no sun up in the sky. Stormy weather, ever since my guy and I ain't together. It's stormy all the time. There's no sun up in the star sky, stormy weather. Then my man and I start show. Maybe I'll have one for Easter. Uh, that girl, she is a great artist, 
but she don't know she can't do nothing with your goods. Y'all can take boat, boats and boats of your goods. And as many as you want to walk by me, I can drape and design and each one will get a different design, baby. I'm a natural. <laughs> um, I started a little beauty shop with one of the guests here. And uh, people could sign up to get their hair done for a small, very, very small amount, if they could. And uh, it inspired them to, you know, uh, be able to keep up with their hairstyles and feel better. And I have a classical music listening hour that turns into three hours. <laughs> the people just come and sit by candlelight. Sometimes there are just a few people who come and then they go. But people hear it all over the shelter, and they love to hear it, and they tell me, oh, that was very pretty last night. And they never once came in, but they'll sit in the hall, or it'll permeate the shelter, and they'll hear it in their room, even though it's very, very quiet. Federal officials said they were tired of negotiating with Mitch Schneider. They withdrew their agreement with CCNB and made plans to close the shelter. CCNB immediately filed suit in district court to keep the shelter open. They're scaring these people to death. They're fragile, they're, their world is shaky. It's a really mean thing to do and it's very consistent with everything else that's gonna happen. Anyone who wants to be sure to get a seat at the court, come on, one group is going to go over it now. Anyone who wants to be sure to get a seat Bullshit! I don't have to wait. I want to go in this building. I'm a plaintiff, too. Why can't I go in? No, he don't care. He just don't care. Okay. We need half the people around the other entrance. Block the other entrance, too. All the way around the other side. Who can go? Okay. Yeah. The rest of us sit here. We don't let anybody in. Yo, as soon as the doors open, push your way in. Don't let anybody in or out. Just sit out. Come on. Besides, they say the courtroom's full. The larger courtroom is the same going. Oh. It's closed, yes. They closed the building down. Rather than let homeless people in. Stop. I believe God wants this shelter because I believe God loves the people of this shelter and I believe God feels these people deserve to live like this simply because God has the love to give them and it's very difficult to understand why God has the love to give and other people don't. A federal judge told the government it could close this shelter on Saturday, calling it unfit for human habitation. But the judge said before the shelter closed, housing must be found for the 600 people who sleep there each night. Eight days remain and still no word as to where the homeless will go. Snyder fears some will stay and die in this building. The feds say they hope to name alternative sites tomorrow. Other groups say they don't believe it. The case will go to federal appeals court next week for one more round. In the meantime, Mayor Barry says if the federal government wants the homeless out of this shelter, don't count on the D.C. police for help. I tell you, it's, this city is a mess. This city is a pretty mess. And we want to change and we need to change. I ain't lying. So great. Where's your daughter at now? My daughter with my sister. What you going to look up? What you going to do? Have you I'll made wait, your mouth? I'll wait till that time comes. Then I can say, then I say what I do. I don't, I don't know. What I'm I'm gonna gonna do. I wouldn't know what I do until they tell you to take me out. <laughs> It depends on, de depend right. on the Lord. Right. That's well, what depends on the Lord. It depends on you. Yeah. Well, you got to find the help yourself. 
Amen. What you going to do? I got somewhere to go. Where you, you got going? somewhere to go? Where you going at? In Maryland. Oh. People that's trying to take it away from CCC and they should take it away from them. Where are these people going to go at if you put them out? On your back porch? You don't want to sleep on your back porch because that's where they wind up at, on your back porch. So you might as well give them somewhere, you might as well give these people somewhere to stay. People do not belong on the streets. It's not safe for cats or dogs. So if y'all was in this situation, y'all wouldn't let y'all close. Y'all wouldn't like to be closed down. So I'm just like asking them to keep the shelter open. It doesn't have a lot of staff, but the staff that it has is nearly saintly. Uh, they do not make you feel bad. I found at the other institutions that there's uh, a patronization and a condescension that can make you feel very, very bad. They say there's a feeling that you ought to pull yourself together, and you say, I can't pull myself together, and, uh, but you always feel that somehow you should just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And yes, that's a very good thing to say, but when you're off your head, it just isn't easy. It's very hard to understand the mentally ill. These people are human beings, just like you and I. Who knows, tomorrow you might be in the same situation. You might not know what to do. You might need medical care or psychiatric care. I spent two tours in Vietnam. Now that hurts me more than anything, the thing that people can destroy life in Vietnam when they can't even take care of life right here in their own backyard. It really hurts. If a bird can have a nest and a fox can have a den, then why the son of man can't have a house over his head? Pepcoat wants to get in. Pepcoat wants to get in. Cal, come here. Did you have them open the door? Open the door. That's what, they want to get to the transformer. Okay, huh? Okay. Okay. They came in, they hung a tag, and they, they threw a breaker. Are they going to turn the lights on by five? No way. They said they'll be on when the cable work is finished. The guy told me it was a 12-hour job. You ever shut down apartment houses with 100, 500 to 1,000 people in it for 12 hours? Nursing homes where there's sick people? Mental hospitals or hospitals? Do you ever do that? Tell me that. Where did you expect them to go? Now, give me an answer. I don't hear anything. I'm not suggesting that Pepco got up this morning and decided to try and mess around with homeless people, but you are now being used by GSA to try and harass us and drive us out of here. We can't, we can't keep this building closed with, with the rain coming down and crippled people coming up to the door. And how are we going to fill up the building without electricity? Bye-bye. No refrigeration for insulin. Right. It's got yeah, diabetics. They have insulin in the building now. We can't even refrigerate the damn stuff. It's obvious what they're doing is to try and force us out of here by turning the lights out and keeping them out until well after the time that people would come in. What's going to happen if the lights don't come back on today? We're going to have to open the building with no lights. Isn't that great? We're not going to make people stand out in the rain. We just won't do that. Only the president's into doing stuff like that. We're not. In the next court ruling, the district judge reaffirmed that the federal government could close the shelter if an alternative site had been found. The government immediately announced its arrangement to fund another group, the D.C. Coalition for the Homeless, to operate a new shelter 10 miles away in Anacostia, the poorest section of D.C. The federal government has signed an agreement with the Coalition for the Homeless as well as a contract which is going to be obligated tomorrow. Which we learned about for the first time in court. Apparently the federal defendants believe that by giving the D.C. coalition this 2.7 million dollars for some federal buildings that they can justify reneging on the commitment that the president made. It's clearly, you know, a case of where we're at, a block away from the Capitol, right behind very desirable property for the Hyatt Regency Hotel. They obviously don't want you know, 700, 800 homeless people right in the heart of downtown Washington, D.C. We're in the heart of town where, where everything is, and we can get food stamps and other things to help us. So it's no use us getting out there and have to be big, boring, steal money to get the places, to get the things we want. 
we will provide transportation for anyone on a daily basis. Where will your buses pick them up? I mean, Where? Wherever is, yeah, but we, know, we know where they congregate. There isn't any need, I think, to transport homeless people like they were some kind of commodity or like they're produce, because they're not, they're people. We have control of the transportation situation, which incidentally will all be paid for by the federal government. On uh, top of the 3.7 million that you got. The, the federal government will cover all related expenses. Well, actually, 3.7 million, believe it or not. What's 3.7? What they're giving. Yeah. Well, that's good. That, in fact, nice. there's another million. There's hey, 2.7 from actually, yours, plus another million from uh, elderly, at least according to the press release. Yeah. Well, that's good. They've identified another source of funds for us. That's very appreciated. Uh, but I, it's not a, it's not a question of competition. Okay. There's a great gap in, being, in what is being said here that I have to concentrate on. Mitch is saying that CCNV is not blocking the opening of a shelter in other wards in the city. You have no objection to shelters being opened. I will concede. In, in no, the only the, the only objection we have is when people do it in a really heavy-handed way and get everybody pissed off because that's not. It's an art getting a shelter into a neighborhood. You cannot trample the neighbors, whether it's Georgetown or Anacostia. We would show no There's less no respect. The name of the game about. is save the lives of the people about. on the street, Larry, I wish not that you me were or your to that. Mitch, If you were committed to that, you wouldn't put people Larry, in Larry, I live in a shelter. The question has been not <coughs> just Mitch Snyder. We're talking about the community sure. for creative nonviolence. No, no, no that's the man, right? That's the power right there. He However, runs that. Well, he's speaking for the CCM. <laughs> no, he runs it. At this you point. tell the other 45 or 50 people that work 12 hours a day that I'm the entire community, they will eat you alive. If he were really concerned about the homeless, he would release those people from the potential Jim Jones situation that he individually, because he's a cult leader, is putting them in at second and deep. Why is he attacking our attempt to do what? Open a shelter. When he is the cause of us having to go to, fe to the federal government for buildings. We don't attack you. We don't even consider you consequential, Larry. The Good. problem is that you Get out are, of our way, then. The problem let us, is uh, let us leave the we are not in your way. You wouldn't have any access are. to any money if we hadn't got the president to make the commitment. You are being used as a wedge between us and the administration. You're going to have to move out of the way. And when you do, we're going to face the administration head on. And then let me tell you, brother, we're going to push them right out of this damn city because they are the most vile, vulgar, insensitive, inhuman, human beings that we have ever seen. And you shouldn't let them use you. Well, I think anyone look at the uh, facts of, of the shelter. Uh, I have never seen the shelter. I've never been inside the shelter. I have talked with many, many people current residents, former residents, some of the descriptions of it. Uh, well, the most consistent description I've heard is, is refer referring to it as Jonestown on the Potomac. But that's other people's views. I don't have them uh, because I've not been in the shelter. I'm very sad that things are the way they are at this particular moment. Um, we'd hoped that something could be worked out about the renovation at Second and D, but since it has not, um, you know, for all Mitch's gifts, and he is a genius at communicating and stirring people's interest, and, and he has a great love for these people. But sometimes the most charismatic leader is not the best shelter operator. The city can be very fortunate that there is the D.C. Coalition for the Homeless. We're very comfortable with their experience and capability. It's a good organization. We feel a peculiar kind of outrage at not being consulted or giving an opportunity for community input at the early. The federal stage. government and D.C. Coalition for the Homeless plan to bus 600 men each day to this old federal building near the Anacostia River. Save our children. Residents say their neighborhood is being used as a dumping ground. Save our community. They do not want a shelter for homeless men moved into their community. Enough is enough, is enough. I resent the fact that they say we don't want to deal with problems. We already have the highest rate of unemployment. We already have the highest amount of food stamp recipients. We already are feeding the hungry, the needy, the helpless, why are you putting this burden on us again? We don't need it. We won't go. Hell no. We won't go. We're not going to not because we're not wanted. The shelter in Anacostia is intended to replace the facility in northwest Washington run by Mitch Schneider. 
The president's people didn't want to deal with Mitch, so they gave the money to the D.C. Coalition for the Homeless. They drove the vans, and Mitch's homeless friends tried to drive them away. We have had reports from people who have been inside the shelter indicating that both the, the psychological condition of the residents is that there's a siege mentality, which we think exploits those people, by the way, uh, in defense of a, a supposed attack to secure the facility by the federal government. We understand that they have bunkered in the third floor from reports and that there may in fact be explosives and, and weapons. Whether those reports are true or not, we're going to take the safest course of action in, in an effort to protect the people who are using that facility so that they don't become innocent victims of some sort of a violent uh, confrontation. I haven't heard that they were going to barricade this up on the third floor. So you can't play the newspaper any attention because they're trying to sell papers. Oh, no, it's going to be nonviolent all the time, you know. We ain't going to never be violent. You say you're going to take the safest course of action to protect against violence. What is that course of action? We will provide an alternative facility at the Anacostia uh, site. We will provide transportation readily accessible by the homeless population that currently use Second and D Street. We will uh, have a, an appropriate transition time where people will see that our commitment is real to provide service to them and what they're being told by the present operators the 2nd D Street shelter facility simply doesn't measure up to the truth. So you don't have any plans to try to shut down that, that facility? At the conclusion of the transition period, the federal government will secure the building. We will not allow it to be used as a homeless facility. The Anacostia answer ain't an answer. My friends will die. I know the truth. I know that if that shelter shuts down as rotten as it is, hundreds and hundreds of people will go back to the streets. I know that I will have to claim their bodies. No one else. I know that I'm going to have to see feet cut off and hands lying there next to the person because they had to cut them off because they froze, because people didn't care enough to pay attention to the details. If it was this building for which renovation was being discussed, you all would be all over the process. You would want to look at the architect's plans. You would want to know that it was done right. If it was the White House they were redecorating or renovating or moving, you bet your bottom dollar it would go someplace dirty and safe. But it's not. It's just a bunch of poor folks. So put them anywhere, whether it's appropriate or not. But they won't go anywhere, and they will die. And nobody bothered to ask them because nobody really cared about them. Not in the federal government at any rate. They obviously don't because the plan they put together is guaranteed to kill some of these folks. So that's why we fight for a flea-bitten, run-down, rat-infested place because it's better than nothing and the alternative is nothing and all the bullcrap about buses and services for 30 days is just a cover and a front for a broken promise and for an unwillingness to deal with a national crisis and what's being played out by this administration is being played out in the hearts and minds of everyone in this nation saying keep those people away I can't stand to look at them they make me frightened and they make me uncomfortable because they make me think of me Mitch, for you. What's it say? Get out of here. That's what it says. Yeah. No, we already know what the notice means. Okay. We know exactly what the government's doing. I'm just going to see And if we can be of any assistance. Well, I will. Actually, the only assistance would be to stop the government from trying to throw uh, 650 people out in the street. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. We also had it done in Spanish. Uh -huh. We had it done in Spanish. Okay, so, everybody, everybody understands what the situation is. Okay. Everybody's going to be out. You're going to be out too. 
Cracker Boy? They have nowhere to go. Given that winter is approaching, as is Christmas, as is a weekend of cold, that the timing is probably about as inhuman as it's possible to get. storm the building. We had people walking all around the building, outside the building with walkie-talkies, in communication with people inside the building. We stockpile large quantities of water and cigarettes, all the basics. And it was a long night. We were as prepared as we could be, and we just waited. And it didn't come. The morning of that night, clouds passed. There was a moment at which everybody knew that the forces of darkness had been beaten back and this building was going to be renovated and nothing could stop it because we had gotten through that night. In the 11th hour, the eviction was halted. An aide to Republican Senator Mark Andrews, who volunteered at the shelter, was appalled that the administration was actually going to forcibly storm the shelter. He asked the senator to call the White House to intervene. President Reagan decided against evictions at the shelter, and Washington, D.C.'s Mayor Marion Barry, who had been waiting for the federal government to act, contributed funds to carry them through the winter. But it was only a stopgap measure. There was still no federal money available for the promised model shelter. In the meantime, Mitch Schneider and the CCNB's fight for the homeless attracted Hollywood's attention, and a made-for-TV movie was filmed in Washington. question how many pairs of shoes did I own well, that's where you begin with Mitch I own too many things and I have too big an image and I don't have any courage so. what can I tell you I'm like a whole lot of other folks in this town and in this world I guess I'm attached to material possessions I think they're me always oh, I think it's four dollars an hour and what I'm gonna do with mine is give it to my son that's what I'm going to do with mine. I don't have to play no part to be a human being. You understand what I'm saying? I don't have to do that. Because I am already just like you. People. Straight up beautiful people. Unusual reception I have been 
I was in different capitals of the world, you know, in London, in Paris, in, in, uh, in everywhere, you know, and that's for the first time I see two classes meeting, you know, that's very interesting. We are proud that we haven't got that in the Soviet Union. We have only one class. Now, we invited the folks from the White House because we wanted to say thank you for the fact that they didn't evict us. But it would also have been a good time to remind them that President Reagan promised to renovate this building and turn it into a model shelter. And if that promise were made to anybody other than a group of homeless people, if that promise were made to terrorists in the Middle East, that promise would be kept. But because it's been made to us, it hasn't yet been kept. And there's always been the outcasts and the untouchables and the people in this world that no one else wanted to see or touch or smell that God has rested most closely with. And so that's why ultimately we will prevail, as will the truth, and I hope, I pray that soon, in whatever way, it will come to an end. The CCNV continued its struggle for the model shelter the government still did not respond. Snyder went on two more hunger strikes before federal officials finally capitulated and promised $5 million for the shelter. The promised shelter opened in stages four years after the struggle began. D.C. Mayor Barry, Senator Mark Hatfield, and homeless advocate Mitch Snyder used an old pair of hedge clippers to snip a ribbon officially opening the phase one renovation of the shelter thanks to six and a half million dollars from Congress and contributions from various companies. Two floors on the south side of the dilapidated building have now been completely redone and the air is still thick with a smell of fresh paint. <laughs> Never knew how the bed feel. They ain't have time to get a bed set. I feel good, too. Mm. <laughs> that feels good. Nice and soft, too, compared to them cots. All we tried to do was to create a place within which people can find that which they need to pull their lives back together again. So you have a medical clinic. And we've got dental services, mental health services, a 22-bed drug and alcohol detox section full array of social services, job and housing assistance, uh, literacy training, legal assistance, uh, counseling. We teach classes here. I have got medical help, social work and help, and I went to school because of these people right here. I also got a job with the Marine Department, and if it wasn't for this place, I don't know where I would be at. You know, I just thank God that I could have been just like really a bum, you know, that, that's, out in the, that's out in the streets. So I just thank God. It's the act of the Lord, and you know, I hope somebody else will get help. Somebody else will get help, just like I did.
The D.C. Coalition for the Homeless, who operated the Anacostia shelter, had their $2 million payment from the government suspended because of alleged mismanagement of funds. Former HHS official C. McLean Haddow pleaded guilty to kickback charges on a completely unrelated matter and was sentenced to prison. And Granny, bless her soul, suddenly disappeared. Some say she was last seen going to Richmond in a white Cadillac. This shelter survives, but for millions of homeless across America, there is no relief, and their numbers continue to grow.